It took me a while to find a way to approach the subject of today's Mad Musings. Emberwind, a Kickstarter release by Nomnivore Games. It's a high fantasy setting and a concept that blurs the line between RPG and board game. It advertises that it can be played without a DM, but there's a reason why almost every game has one of those. After reading it about three times and testing it out on my usual suspects, I'm not sure what it was trying to be. I don't know if the designers knew either. It sold well enough on their Kickstarter, so apparently somebody liked the concept. But many Kickstarters look great on paper. Is Emberwind a good RPG or not? That's not the question. The question is how far can you stray from a standard role-playing game and it still be a role-playing game? I'm Mr. Welch, and remind me again why they need me? First, the technical aspects, because people who do the work to make a game deserve to be mentioned. Eric Weiss and Derek Chung wrote Emberwind. I don't know if Eric Weiss is a pen name or the writer shares his name with Harry Houdini. It's just a strange coincidence. It's a cool coincidence, don't get me wrong. I trained to be a magician in middle school, but I just didn't have the manual dexterity. It's just one of those little things you catch when you do a review. Though Nomnivore Eric doesn't spell his name with an H as Houdini did. Also, I don't know if it's Weiss or Weiss. I've heard it both ways, depending on how Germanic you want it to sound. But I digress. The art is attributed to Crush Visual Studios rather than a single artist. The starter book is 128 pages full color, but they didn't skimp on the art. It's got a brushstroke visual style, which isn't cheap. That also explains why the books are $50 and up. If you want good art, you pay for good art. What's the game like? That's tricky to say. Here's the best appropriate allegory I could find. Saute ground beef, onions, and peppers in a Dutch oven for 30 minutes until brown. Then drain the grease, add garlic, salt, Italian seasoning, Worcestershire sauce, and cook for two minutes. Stir in tomatoes, corn, beef broth, and tomato sauce, and bring to a simmer. Add in noodles, stir, cover, cook for 12 minutes, pour into a bowl, and add cheese. That's the recipe for goulash, a Hungarian dish that's a mixture of just about everything. Goulash and Houdini? That's an unexpected Hungarian vibe for this review. The point I'm making is that Emberwind combines many elements that don't seem to work well together and appear in many ways like a potluck. This is because Emberwind uses multiple systems for various mechanics, and each player decides which mechanics they want to use. It comes across as somewhat gimmicky, with monster designs that look like they came from HeroScape, and switching out dice for cards for at least one mechanic. The initial book, The Skies of Axia, read like a choose-your-own-adventure, with the players swapping turns reading each page to describe what happens. It's meant to be played on a board rather than theater of the mind, and the monster design hammers that home. The base dice mechanics are a d20 system, with the price is right mechanics, as I call them. You want to roll under your target number without going over. Like the alternative system, the lower you roll, the better you get, as you hit thresholds based on how much under your target you get. Nothing special happens outside of basic success if you barely make your roll. If you roll under the accuracy threshold, you get an armor-piercing hit and inflict full damage. If you get the critical threshold, which is usually 5 to 10%, you do maximum damage. These effects stack, so roll low. We've seen mechanics like this before, not just in Alternity, but in Fading Suns. We're dealing with familiar rules when it comes to the dice. It has advantages and disadvantages, which work as a reroll, just like every other game that uses that mechanic. Except you can have multiple advantages or disadvantages and just roll more dice or draw more cards as the situation warrants. The other system available for skill tests is the Deck of Fates. This looks like a pointless cash grab. It's a deck of cards that have the word either success or failure on them. That's it, just a binary outcome on each card. They offer the deck on their website for $23 to rub it in. The cards don't have the elaborate art the books enjoy, just a circle or a sun with the word success or failure. It says you can use regular playing cards with reds working as successes or blacks as failures. Save yourself $20 and get a pack of Hoyles at the gas station. The way this system works is you make a deck of 20 cards, with the number of success cards equal to your skill and the rest of the deck being failure cards. Then you draw one card. If you have advantage or disadvantage, you draw that many more cards and select either the good result or the bad result, depending on what you have. This only applies to role-playing tests. Combat uses the dice system. Players can choose which mechanic they want for skill tests. The cards have a problem. If the player makes another skill test with a different value, they have to rebuild the deck again. Game combat uses an action point system with a streamlined initiative. The game is balanced for four players, as it mentions this more than once. No more, no less. When you face bad guys, you take turns. One player gets to go, then a bad guy, then the next player, then back and forth. The enemies have specific slots to fill, so grunts go first, then awakened foes, elites, and finally the boss at the end. If you have multiple mooks, they all go in the grunt phase. Players decide at the start of each round who goes in what order. If there are no enemies of a particular type, or the player who was supposed to go is indisposed, then that gets skipped. This does mean a fight without bosses, or a boss battle without mooks, has players going several times in a row. Again, this feels like a board game in this section. 
Action points are the primary combat mechanic, with various actions available on your turn, and off-turn actions if you bank points. Generally, slow actions are two action points, fast actions take one, and free actions don't cost any. Trigger actions are available, again, off-turn, if you didn't spend all of your points. There are amplified actions that are tied to specific occurrences in the game. If you meet the qualifier, pay the action point, and activate the amplifier. Like twisting the knife on a successful stab. You also have your class actions, including powerful ones known as Tide Turners. Those fall into the read the instructions and spend the cost rules. There are nine classes. Archer, Rogue, Warrior, Spiritualist, Atlanta, Tactician, Ardent, Druid, and Invoker. Character creation is a template overlay. You take your base stats, apply various modifiers from all the options, and select your abilities. All the abilities are combat related. There are no special options if you want to be an explorer or a skill monkey. Every class skill is intended to be used in a fight. This game is giving me flashbacks to another RPG that had a similar style, Iron Kingdoms. Well, not as flawed as Iron Kingdoms. Its complete focus on combat again makes me think this is a different game wearing an RPG suit. There are four starting levels. It's up to the players to decide if they want to be a grunt, rookie, or a grizzled veteran, or anything in between. The actual benefits of this is just more templates to apply to the character sheets, increasing their combat abilities and giving benefits to skills passively. The rules for monsters are one of the more original designs I've seen, and again, I don't know if that's a good thing. You can make something that plays so differently that it wanders into gimmick territory. In the case of monsters, the dice decide what they do. This is part of the no DM selling point. Looking at our Plague Brute here, you will see his attack chart on the right. When it's his turn, you roll a d6 and the chart tells you what he does. He always has his special attack A, then one of the six actions depending on the dice. A roll of 1 means he follows up with a basic attack and then special attack B. A roll of 6 means he follows up his initial attack with special attack B. The monster's card tells you who he targets and any additional rules he might have. If you're playing with a DM, obviously they can overrule this, but this is meant to simplify play. This isn't a mechanic that was well liked when we tried it. It was easy to exploit and felt like it was out of a video game. This was hammered home because the game is explicitly designed to be played on a hex grid. It made Emberwind feel even less like an RPG. There is a starter adventure, one that was released first after the Kickstarter, The Skies of Axia. It's designed to introduce the players to the game, though rather annoyingly, the sample characters included don't have their character sheets in the book, you have to download them from the website. The website that's still incomplete. This book raised a lot of eyebrows for several reasons. First, it's in landscape form rather than the standard layout. There's a reason why we don't make books in this style. They don't do well on bookshelves. Just look at Underground with its notebook that everybody hated because of the design choice. The other reason was for a 128-page book, it was listed at $60 retail. That's half the size of similar books with the same price point. The art is pretty, I won't deny that. But that price point makes many people look for something with a little bit more meat on its bones. The Skies of Ixia plays out like a choose-your-own-adventure book, only in cooperative mode. Players take turns reading different parts of the book, just like in Sunday School. When they come to a part with a decision in it, they vote on which action is taken, then turn to that page and follow the instructions. It became box text the reading for a while. It's designed to showcase the game mechanics, and there are quite a few mechanics. But it came off as clunky and a bit tedious when people got tired of passing the book around. That's when I finally made up my mind. This needs to be a board game like Hero Quest or Gloomhaven, or any other game in a similar vein that came before it. As I kept reading the rules, they reminded me more of miniature heavy dungeon crawl board games than a role playing game. The lack of any abilities that weren't combat related, the fact that the group heals immediately after each battle, the heavy number crunch, the self controlled monsters, and the focus on placement, movement, and grid based maps. This wants to be a board game. It needs to be a board game. It's not the first time I've seen games like this. Iron Kingdoms was a war game where you played a single model. Baron Munchausen was more like a storytelling game than an RPG, which people immediately recognized in its favor. Space 1889, like many GDW games, was a combat simulator with a charisma stat. It's not a bad thing if it's done right. There's a market for this, but I don't know if it will appeal to many role-playing game players because it lacks so many RPG elements. D&D 3.5 might have been the crunchiest and most combat monster happy version of the game, but at least it had character abilities that could occasionally be used outside of combat. Players will balk at the high price point. The website is still incomplete years after launch, making finding answers to questions difficult. There are other DLCs to download which give more monsters and adventures, but they make it feel more like a board game still. If this was marketed like Warhammer Quest with HeroScape hexbase tiles and sold books with monster packs as add-on pieces, Emberwind might attract a much larger audience. People like games like that, but it has to be done correctly. You can't take a game out of one element like an adventure book and turn it into a role-playing game. Mechanics rarely translate well from one medium to another. 
if Ember Wind was a $100 box set sitting on a shelf with a whole host of miniatures inside and sold later books as additional adventures, it would draw in board gamers looking for something like that. It's a decent combat system, but it doesn't translate well to an RPG. That's Ember Wind. I've read this book multiple times. I got my family involved, and it took me forever to figure out what was nagging me about it. It's a combat simulator, but it's not bad. If it was a computer game, this might even get more attention, especially with Baldur Gate 3 being the hotness at the moment. But as an RPG, it's limited, it's expensive, and it's a bit too crunchy for my tastes. Enough talking about a game that I didn't like, it's time to talk about one that I did. I'm headed back to the world of darkness to discuss the first cousin of Vampire the Masquerade, Mummy the Resurrection. The game that showcases the rise, pinnacle, and fall of the World of Darkness metaplot in three books. Until next time, I will not buy this record. It is scratched.